Coming up on the last call for the second week in a row, at least three teams in the top ten suffered a loss. Would Georgia and Alabama join Auburn on that list? Plus, we're inching closer to the playoffs for high school football. We'll hit rewind on week nine of the prep zone and take you through the biggest games from this past week. It's all on the last call, and it starts right now. Welcome back to The Last Call. I'm your host, Justin Holbrock. October can be scary, and it's been downright terrifying for college football teams ranked in the top 10. Last week, three teams in the AP Top 10 lost, and yesterday we saw four more go down. Let's run it back. So, top 10 teams are dropping left and right, but the one stable continues to be the Alabama Crimson Tide. Let's see if they could keep the status quo in their game last night. The Tide were hosting 3-2 Missouri at Bryant-Denny Stadium. First quarter we go, Heisman favorite Tua Tunga Vialoa has a favorite target and that guy is Jerry Judy and he finds him once again right down the middle and from there, he gone 81 yards for the touchdown. Judy is tied for second in the country with eight receiving touchdowns. 13 seconds left in the first. Look at all the time Drew Locke has. He has enough time to point to somebody to tell them where to go. That somebody is Jalen Knox and it's now 13 to 10 tied after one. Bama gave up 31 points last week and it looks like it might happen again. Second quarter now, Tua drops that back and down the pipe he finds Irv Smith Jr. 20 to 10 tied. The defense steps up and Tua is feeling it now. Another touchdown, this one to Devontae Smith for 13 yards, 27-10 tied. Tua re-injured a sprained knee in the third quarter. He did not return and his status is unknown at this time, but the tie did win 39 to 10. All right, Washington, West Virginia, and Penn State were the top 10 teams that lost yesterday. Georgia trying not to be on that list. Tough test in Death Valley. Second quarter, huge fourth and goal. Joe Burrow keeps it, and he's in. 10-0 LSU. They led 16-0 at the half. To the second half, Elijah Holyfield puts Georgia on the board. A 10-yard touchdown run. The two-point attempt failed. 19-9 LSU. Dogs have a lot of work to do in the fourth. But they can't stop Burrow, who gets in for his second Russian tutty. LSU gives Georgia its first loss of the year by winning big, 36-16. to All right, since the inception of the college football playoff four years ago, no two-loss team has ever made the Final Four. Well, Auburn already has two losses after falling to Mississippi State last week, so the Tigers' chances of making the playoff are very, very slim. Tigers hoping to turn around their season yesterday with a home matinee against Tennessee, which, by the way, has lost 11 straight games in the SEC. Good start for Auburn. Chandler Cox, a one-yard touchdown run. Both teams added a field goal, so it was 10-3 after the first. We know about Auburn's Jarrett Stidham, but how about Tennessee's Jarrett Garantano? He hits Ty Chandler across the middle, 42 yards for the score, and the game is locked at 10 apiece. Will the real Jarrett please stand up? When Stidham has time to throw, he can be a pretty good quarterback, and he has time, and here he finds Anthony Schwartz, who, by the way, is a track all-star. He shows why. He gone 76 yards for the score, 17 to 10 Tigers. The Tigers secondary struggled all game, though, against the Vols wideout, and they do it again here. Jawan Jennings gonna make this catch for 25 yards from Garantano, and the Vols grab their first lead, 20 to 17, and this, was really the nail in the coffin. Auburn's O-line, we know the problems they have. The Vols get to them, they push back, and the ball pops out. Cue the circus music. It looks like Tennessee has it there. Looks like they have it again, but then somehow it ends up in the hands of Elante Taylor in the end zone. Tennessee up 10, they win 30 to 24. What is happening in the Plains? You know, right now, I mean, my feelings are, um, I'm disappointed um, for our team. Um, and everything. I'm not ready to sit here and make any kind of uh, talk about staff or players other than I'm disappointed. Uh, we're going to watch the film um, and we're going to get this thing corrected and that's my responsibility as head coach. Up next for Auburn is a road game at Ole Miss next week. All right, Cam Newton, the Panthers couldn't win today, but the soccer team did, and their 1-0 win over Missouri was the 300th career win for Auburn head coach Karen Hoppe. Hoppe is now the 28th coach in the history of the sport to amass 300 wins at the Division I level. She's also just the eighth female head coach to accomplish that feat. Congrats, coach. That's awesome. All right, still to come in the last call, we've got more football this time from Friday Night Lights and even a couple pushback to Saturday due to Hurricane Michael. Those highlights are coming up. 
Well, we'll start off in Alabama. The Smith Station Panthers were the doormat of the Valley last year, but this year, they're playoff contenders. Tonight, they went up against a possible state championship contender in the Auburn High Tigers. 11 minutes left in the first. On third and seven, Corey Minton tries to buy some time, but the Florida commit, Mahmoud Diamante, chases him down. Jaden Johnson finishes the job. Panthers were forced to punt. Under a minute left in the first, still nothing. Sterling Evil Sizer gets rocked by Jarius Durrell. Panthers eventually went three and out there. We were tied at zero at the end of one, but here goes Jay Walker to get the party started in the second. Slices up the middle for a big game. First down, Tigers. Two minutes later, Tigers knocking on the door. Griffin speaks, fakes the handoff, finds Walker, turns on the Jets. Finally, busts into paradise for the first touchdown of the night. Extra point was no good, so it's 6-0. Then Auburn decides to bust the game open. They shut out the Panthers 34-0. The undefeated Central Red Devils back at home tonight hosting Lee Montgomery. Devils actually fumbled on the opening kickoff. Not like them to do that. Lee would get on the board this way. D. Yunk Rhea Lewis brings in the pass, make it 7-0 Lee. Here's the thing. Here comes Central. LSU commit. Peter Pierce connects with Lewis Hicks. Takes off and goes off 31 yards to the house. And we got ourselves a new ball game. We're tied at 7. A few minutes later, Parrish, he's got some legs, calls his own number, keeps it, goes straight down the middle, untouched, into the end zone. Devils went for two, missed it, it was 13-7 there. Right now, the Devils all over them, 44-17. to You follow Travels North to take on the Warriors at Russell County. Tigers, first drive of the game. Quarterback Hess Horn would scramble to his left, buying some time, and eventually finds his man Montavious Duckworth. Great name. Makes a nice snag for the first touchdown of the night. Make it 6 nothing. Tigers. Next drive for you follow. Y'all, stick around. You got to check this out. Horn shoots into Varius Green on the slant. Looks like he's going down. Nope. Hits the spin button. Runs all the way around the outside. Dives in for the end zone. You know what? Put him up, ref. It's a touchdown. Yufala goes on to win this one. 52 to 31. Over in Valley, Alabama, the Beulah Bobcats off to one of their best starts in the past two decades, but early on, the Trojans would actually strike first. Eight minutes left in the first. Colin Duncan with the play action finds a wide open Michael Shalida. Make it seven zip Trojans. Bobcats were down 14-0 in the second, but here comes Caden Dowell, finds some daylight, runs through the Trojans, Bobcats are on the board. A few minutes later, there goes that man again. Dowell shows off the speed, see you later. Right into your living room, dives for the pylon for his second touchdown of the game. St. James does pull away in the second half, though. They win this one 49-20. Sixth-ranked Greenville was all over Beauregard tonight as the Tigers win 34-13. Lafayette steps out of region play and shuts down Alabama Christian 28-6. Top-ranked Lynette keeps on rolling. They handle Lochapoca 42-0. Meanwhile, Glenwood pulls off the upset of the third-ranked Tuscaloosa Academy. The Gators win this one 38-35 in a thriller. Tough season for Lee Scott. Continues as Bessemer Academy wins it big and shuts them out 28-0. Lakeside falls in their bid for a home playoff game as Edgewood wins this one 30 one to seven. No matter where they play, the Marion County Eagles have won every game so far this season, and last week they played just their second home game. Well, we'll get to them eventually. And Ellaville Sly gets the spot and reaches out if they beat Macon County against Marion. Dogs in the red zone. Deshaun Cumbie fakes the handoff and tells Kobe Phillips, "Go get it." High points and snags it in, and Macon County gets on the board. Sly comes with a counter punch. Garrett Peavy hands the rock up to Trey Sampson, goes up the gut, slips through the tackle, and finds paradise. The Wildcats would keep on rolling. Peavy. He rolls to his right and buys some time, tosses it to Zacavius Walker. Check out the catch. In the end, Sly wins his one 37-15 and get a spot in the region for one a title game against Marion County. Speaking of the Eagles, Marion County hosting Central Toppleton in that crazy 3-4-1-A West Division. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why you don't kick to Trayvon Matthews. Find some open space, turns on the Jets, check out the stiff arm. You don't have to do that. That's just mean. See you later. 84 yards to Pater, 7 zip. Eagles. First Eagles offensive drive. Trice McKinnon would find Johnny Walker in the corner. Check out the precision, the touch. He gets the foot down because, of course, he does. Touchdown, Marion County. 14 zip Eagles. Next Eagles drive. Trayvon Matthews, the man who returned that kick, goes up the gut. Nine yards untouched. A lot easier that way. Five offensive plays. Marion County goes up 21 0. These boys look unstoppable. They win tonight 56 14. The Brookstone Cougars playing host to the Manchester Blue Devils in the first half. It was all Cougars. Jeremiah Burgess shows off the speed. See you later. 70 yards for the score. That made it 21-8 Brookstone. In the second half, the Blue Devils woke up. There goes Anthony Ferguson. Finds some daylight. Hits the turbo button. Goes 60 yards to the house. Blue Devils trail 21-14. 
Fourth and goal for Brookstone, and you know who they call on? Yeah, you know, it's Jeremiah Burgess, punches it in. Cougars go up 31-22, and the Cougars bounce back from the loss last week, beating Manchester 31-22. Let's swing up to LaGrange at Troop County. First quarter, Troop up by seven. They got the ball. Kobe Hudson buying some time, fires a strike to Jacoby Smith, who's on the other team. Takes it 15 yards downfield. Same quarter, though. Hudson wants to make up for that, drops back, sees nobody, and says, you know what? I got this. Jukes out one defender. Whoop! Eats up 23 yards of real estate. That would set up this. That works one, so let's call my number again. Takes it in for the nine-yard score to bring his team up to 14 points. In the end, Troop County stays perfect on the year. They beat up on LaGrange 35-14. Columbus and Shaw have their game moved back to Friday because of the hur of Hurricane Michael third quarter. Columbus up 13 nothing. Jonathan Dowell keeps it at the keeps it at the one yard touchdown run. Go ahead and make it 20 nothing Columbus. Later in the frame, it's Sean Miller gets the call for a 28 yard field goal try, and he is pure from that distance, making it 23 nothing Blue Devils. 6:30 left in the game. Columbus QB Jonathan Powell gets picked off by the Raiders, who are finally showing some life thanks to Amir Harper. Intercepted goes 60. Nine yards for the touchdown score. Then Shaw went for two and missed it. Twenty make it 23-6, but that was about it. It was all Blue Devils tonight. They go, they get back back wins beating Shaw 23 to 6. Heard County and Benton Cadet Stadium to take on the Jordan Red Jackets midway through the first. Let's start with some defense. Heard County Sean Johnson comes up with a pick and he's got reservations for six. That will make it 14-0. Brave. Ensuing Red Jackets possession. Emmanuel Mann has some trouble finding the handle. Heard County Zalen Woods recovers. Sorry, Jordan. It only gets worse from here. Very next play, the Braves Aaron Beasley takes a nap, finds the end zone going around the right side, and Hurt County would run all over Jordan tonight. They beat the Red Jackets 58-6. to Let's swing over to Cassetta where Pelham faced off against Chatco. Hornets up 7-0 already. Javoris Williams bangs it up the middle for the 7-yard score, make it 14-0 Pelham. Next Pelham drive, it's true and pace. Taking it to his left side, hits the turbo button, gets to the edge, and guess what? That's good enough for a touchdown, 21-0 Pelham. Chatco trying, just trying to find some life. Kawan Harris on the option handoff, but the Pelham defender <laughs> drills him after a short gain. Pelham will go on to roll this one. 48 to 6. Now let's catch up with some other action around the state. The Calvary Christian Knights squared off against Lafayette Christian. They win tonight. Big 36 to 6. Pacelli hangs on to win over Greenville 25 to 22. Now, due to the impact of Hurricane Michael in our area, these games have been rescheduled to Saturday. Northside will hit the road to face on America's Sumter. Over in LaGrange, the Spencer Green Wave will play the second ranked Callaway Cavaliers. Kickoff for both games is set for noon. Meanwhile, we have a couple of games that have been postponed until further notice due to Hurricane Michael. Carver's home game with Westover and Hardaway's road game with Doherty will be made up at some point. Now, when we get those details, we'll let you guys know as soon as possible. Here are those games pushed back from Saturday. America Sumter made up their home game against Northside. Under three minutes left in the second. The Panthers are up by three. KJ Harvey rolls out and airmails a beautiful ball to Michael Johnson. Easy run into the end zone. Extra point no good. America leads nine zip. And it stayed that way to the second half. All right, the last few seconds of the third quarter, Harvey fires a pass to Montrellis Wilson. He coughs it up and the Patriots recover with great field position and they make the Panthers pay because on the next possession, Northside calls on Fred Davis Jr. He gets in and puts the Patriots on the board. That makes it 9-7 with 11 minutes left in the game. Fast forward to 38 seconds left in the game. Patriots have a chance for the go-ahead field goal, but the kick doesn't have enough leg on it and the Panthers escape with the 9-7 win. Also happening on Saturday, it was homecoming for the second-ranked Callaway Cavaliers as they hosted the Spencer Green Wave. Late in the first quarter, Jacob Freeman honoring a teammate with a different jersey, and he's faking out everybody for the 11-yard touchdown run. 7-0 Callaway. Next Callaway drive, Freeman fires a short pass to Nathan Sapp, and he outruns everybody 53 yards to Pater. Cavaliers lead 13 zip. Cavs ball once again, Freeman rolling out. Going to find a new guy this time. It's Marcus Mormon, and he gets in for the short touchdown. Callaway goes up 20 to nothing, and the Cavs once again another drive. This one it's going to end in the field goal, but we'll take it 39 yards from Hunter Williamson. That makes it 23-0. And late in the first half, they give it to the tank. Tank Bigsby, he gets in from six yards out. Callaway led 30 nothing at half, and they roll to a 30 to seven win. All right, coming up next, our so-called experts make our picks of the week. You'll want to see it. Stick around.
Welcome back to Picks of the Week. I'm joined, as always, by our wonderful director, Jack Patterson. Jack, what's up, man? How's it going, guys? All right, let's get right to it. We're doing baseball first because we're heading into the ALCS and the NLCS. It's already started, but we're starting to get in the heat of things. Which way are you going and who are you taking? I'm taking the Bo Sox. Uh, Red Sox, best team in baseball for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I know they've gotten off to a slow start against the Astros. I mean, they're the defending champs for a reason, right. but I'm going to stick with the Red Sox. By the time this airs, they could be down 2-0 to Houston, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. I'm going to take the series that's already lock because I'm afraid of going that way. Mm -hmm. uh, right now it's 1-1 between the Dodgers and the Brewers and it's heading back to LA. So I like the team that's already stole one on the road. So I'm going to go with LA in that one. All right. We are switching to basketball because the NBA is back. You can pick any game from the first week. Jack, what do you got? Uh, going to go with, my, with the Hawks. But I mean, you really think they're not scheduled to be good this year. So who are you going to pick? They're playing the Grizzlies. So I'm taking the Hawks. On a side note, the other Atlanta team that was not supposed to be good this year was the Braves, and they made a postseason appearance for the first time in five years. So don't write any team off because the season hasn't started just yet. Exactly. All right, I am going to go ahead and take the Boston Celtics to beat the 76ers. That game is in Boston. Not only do I think they're going to win that first game, but I think they have a chance to go all the way to the title and possibly, possibly upset the Warriors this year. East is wide open. We'll see how that goes. There is no LeBron, no problem. Exactly, right? <laughs> All right, and rounding it out, we got our personal pick. What you doing? Uh, going to the pitch, Atlanta United. We're second to last week of the MLS season. Okay. So I'm going to take Atlanta United to get points over the Chicago Fire and then the New York Red Bulls to either tie or lose against the Philadelphia Union. If the if United win and the Red Bulls lose, that gives them the support, supporter shield, which is what I will think will happen a week early. Interesting. All right, I'm going to do the other football. I'm going college football. Game day is going to be in Washington State for the first time ever. They're ranked 25, but they're taking on Oregon, which just beat Washington. So I'm going to take Oregon in that one. All right, real quick, let's do Rex and Connor. All right, Rex, he is taking his hometown Astros to knock off the Red Sox. He's taking the Lakers over the Trailblazers. And, of course, because it's Houston, he is taking the Rockets over the Pelicans. All right, Connor agrees with me for the NLCS. He's taking the Dodgers as well. He's also going with you with the Hawks, but he's taking their first game. That's over the Knicks in New York. And, finally, his alma mater of Georgia Southern over New Mexico State. No NASCAR two weeks in a row, man. It's a miracle. You're never surprised by Connor, are you? Nope. <laughs> All right, that's it for Picks of the Week. We'll be right back after this. The Atlanta Braves playoff run came to an end this week when they lost in four games to the Dodgers. What stands out to you in that sentence? For me, it's the Braves and the playoffs in the same breath. This was supposed to be a team that would finish in the bottom third in all of baseball and be one of the worst teams in the NL East. Instead, they won 90 games and clinched the division for the first time in five years. This young team, sixth youngest in all of baseball, was headlined by 20-year-old Ronald Acuna Jr. and 21-year-old Ozzie Albies. Both made the All-Star game, and so did first baseman Freddie Freeman, the leading vote-getter, as well as veteran Nick Markakis. Aside from youth, the other unknown was Atlanta's pitching staff. Well, the unit ended up with the second lowest opponent batting average and seventh lowest earned run average. Sure, you'd like for them to still be in, but this year, being in far exceeded expectations. And by the time next season comes around, they'll be capable of chopping just about anybody. It was a great ride. It was um, surpassed everybody's expectations. They never quit, they never stopped fighting all year. It was an unbelievable group to be around. I'm honored to have had the privilege um, to manage all those guys. I mean, from the get go, it's just, just it's a great, great group of guys. Snicker is in the running for National League Manager of the Year. We'll keep an eye on that. All right, in Atlanta, the Falcons are the second worst team when it comes to points allowed. The only team worse than the Dirty Birds are the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And today, the two NFC South teams faced off in the bins. Jameis Winston making his first start for the Buccaneers this season after being suspended for the first three games. First quarter, 6 nothing Buccaneers, Matt Ryan. Oh, this is a touchdown for Winston, actually. His first of the year as a starter. Buccaneers go up 6-0. There's Matt Ryan. He goes to Muhammad Sanu. Look at this. He stays in bounds and leaps for the touchdown. What an effort. 7-6 Falcons, and that kid has a brand new ball. Third drive for Atlanta, and they are 3-for-3 three three in the end zone. This is actually the second touchdown for them. Ito Smith runs it in. This is the third drive. This one's going to go to the tight end Austin Hooper on the flat. And like I said, 3-for-3 three three in touchdowns. Dead last in points, Tampa Bay. That's showing why. But don't forget, Atlanta's pretty rocky, too. O.J. Howard going to get the touchdown for the Buccaneers here. And then it's 31-22. Winston dropping back, finds Peyton Barber. So we've got a two-point game in the fourth. 
Matt Bryant hit a huge 57-yard field goal. Bucks need a touchdown to win. Seven seconds left. Winston rolls out. Look at this. He laterals it, tosses it over to Mike Evans, who tosses it to Deshaun Jackson. But the throw is low. Not enough space. And the Falcons hold on for their second win of the year. We'll be right back after this. Last December, Ryan Shazier, the man that you see right here, suffered a serious spinal injury in the Steelers game at Cincinnati. The 26-year-old Pro Bowler underwent surgery days later, but doctors feared he may never walk again. Well, today, he walked on the same field where he suffered that injury that changed the course of his life. Before the game, Shazier stopped by the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, where he was initially treated after the injury. In an Instagram post, Shazier thanked the doctors who initially treated him by saying, quote, today was an amazing day. I was so thankful to be able to tell everyone thank you. Well, we have to tell him thank you because he continues to make a Shea Lever out of all of us. Just an awesome moment from the NFL. Shows us what sports is really all about. Thanks so much for watching The Last Call. Same time next week, The James Brown Show is next.